Scott McKean here from my City Hall office, which I have not been in uh, much of late. Uh, like a lot of you, I've been working from home, social isolating, social distancing, and like for a lot of you, it has not been easy not being around other people. I live alone in a 550 square foot apartment and that is getting smaller and smaller, I can tell you. But with the weather warming up, I will be outside for walks, probably staying away from the really uh, uh, busier parts of the greater downtown, which I re represent as city council for Ward 6. So uh, I want to thank Des for this invitation to talk today. And uh, the subject is uh, social isolation. So when I got elected to city council in 2013, I went to the mayor and asked about starting a city council initiative. Uh, we titled it Mental Health and Urban Isolation. It was a passion of mine that came out of personal experience as someone who's had uh, his own journey uh, with mental health issues. And also a lot of the writing I did when I was at the Edmonton Journal. So uh, journalist was my career. I was at the Edmonton Journal from uh, 1986 to 2010. So 24 years at the Edmonton Journal and I spent a lot of that time covering City Hall. And out of that came um, a, a deep interest in municipal government and the impact it has on our lives. And one thing led to another. Uh, I ran in 2010, uh, originally and lost, but I ran in a different ward. And I think that was, that's a, it's an interesting issue. People think want to know that you're part of their community, that you have the same experience. So community is something that I wanna talk about today our sense of community and how important that is to feel connected to something. And what we know from research uh, is that there's uh, an epidemic, a quiet epidemic of social isolation in modern cities before COVID-19. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, technology gets blamed, the smartphone gets blamed uh, Facebook gets blamed, but I, you know, I, th I think really if you went back far enough, other technologies changed the world a lot. Television was a major one, but if you went back further, my mom has talked about how they would gather around the radio on a Saturday night and listen to Hockey Night in Canada. Uh, so that may not have been an extreme change to people's lives, but television really changed things. I think people were far more likely to be out and about uh, visiting with neighbors, and television suddenly made it so that you could be home as a family or as a couple or as an individual and be entertained. So the internet, the internet gets blamed, like I say, but it's only really um, uh, sort of has only multiplied the effect that came originally from radio and then television as we became more self-sufficient uh, in our um, entertainment needs. Our sense of being connected to something, unfortunately, our neighbors in our neighborhood and community was replaced by a sense of connection to the people on the radio or the people on the television. And now people uh, on Facebook or Twitter or other um, a zillion other opportunities that the uh, Internet rep represents. But there's also been other research to show that that is... It does not fulfill our need for um, contact with others in the same space, which COVID-19 has uh, largely taken away. So social isolation epidemic in, in modern society. And, and I wanted to say too, that it's, it's, it's also reflective of lifestyle and changes. I read this great piece about the um, the descent of extended family. Uh, you know, there we might talk about the sort of small village of lore or even go back far enough and we lived in, 
our tribe. Uh, and that's where, you know, humans are social animals. And that was reflected in, the, in those small groups that we gathered in. Extent of family in more modern times was how people were collected. So you had much, you were much more likely to have relationships with aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, and they might be part of your daily world. But things changed and people went, families then became more around, based around the nuclear family, just mom and dad, kids. They might go visit grandparents or visit extended family, but day-to-day -day life was based around the nuclear family. Uh, that broke down. Um, the nuclear family broke down as people moved across country for work. Uh, it broke down as fewer and fewer people went to church. Uh, it broke down as um, people did long commutes to and from work. There was just more and more isolating of the individual. And at the same time, uh, we elevated individual achievement above everything else. Um, we might, I think the opposite of that, and I think it's really interesting, having lived through this a few times, when the Abitur Oilers go on a run through the Stanley Cup, that's probably the, the um, most obvious example where as a community, we share a sense of connection to something bigger than the individual, bigger than ourselves. Fascinating that it takes a professional hockey team to get us to feel that way. But that, you know, I, I, I've been through it like a number of times. I remember walking up and down Jasper Avenue after um, Oilers Stanley Cup wins in the glory years and you're just high-fiving people as you went along. And it was an amazing sense of, of being in this celebration all together. Uh, so social isolation, back to that as an epidemic, has real consequences for communities. On the broadest sense, I think people are far less likely to volunteer because social isolation, I believe, and I think we see examples of this, um, exaggerates our sense of privacy. We, we, as we isolate, we, we almost feel like that's what we want, so we want to ensure that we, uh, our, our privacy is protected. And so it gets, it, it sort of self-perpetuates, I believe. And it's a really difficult issue to get at. We've tried a few things through the City Council initiative. Uh, I think we've raised awareness about um, social isolation. But make major changes in the way people live. Oh, it's going to take a long time. Generational, probably unless COVID-19 is the um, slap upside the head we needed to recognize that we rely on each other. Uh, we absolutely rely on each other, not just for quality of life, but for extension or of life, healthcare. Um, so there are impacts um, of social isolation on our sense of self, sense of belonging, our happiness. And um, so depression is inevitable, I think, if you're not connected with other people. Anxiety, I think, is inevitable if you do not feel the support of a connected community. And, and I think that uh, bitterness and division are so typical in today's uh, politics. We see it more in the United States, I think, than in, in Canada. But that real sense of divide and bitterness and anger and frustration with the other is ref a reflection, I believe, of this loss of group connection, this feeling part of, you part of a community, you serve that community, you enjoy the benefits of that community. 
So there are real implications from this broad and rampant sense of social isolation. So I was thinking as I was coming into this about what the solutions are to, to this, and they're really hard to offer solutions during uh, a pandemic. Because the answer is, you know, go join a, a, a club, go join a sports league, go volunteer, volunteer wherever you can, because as you do that, you will get a greater sense of connection to something outside yourself. And there's nothing like serving others to make yourself feel better and make yourself feel part of. Those options aren't available right now. So what am I doing for my mental health? Um, outside of work and that sense of service that my office and I get, and I should mention the tremendous support I get from Roxanne, Roxanne Piper, Rebecca Vischer, and Sydney Gross, who all work in the Ward 6 office, part of a team, and they're fantastic. We have weekly, or weekly, we have daily, uh, sometimes twice daily uh, video conferences, and those are so nourishing to me because I get to connect with people I love uh, around common cause, and that's serving the people of Edmonton and in specifically the people of Ward 6. That's really, that's so important to me, and sometimes we do it twice a day. Going into the long weekend, we talked about maybe doing it again on Monday, and I said, what about Saturday and Sunday? Because uh, I live alone. And those things, that, that group of people, as well as my family, are critical to my sense of belonging to something bigger than me. You know, I play the guitar. You can, might see the guitar up above me here. Uh, that is something I've been working on. Um, I am about to take up photography again. I used to be really quite into it. And uh, with this time, uh, I'm gonna do more photography. And, I, and I'm hoping, and, and stay tuned please, we hope to do something around photography and the ward and our social media so we can get people contributing photos of the ward. You can go out and take photos uh, with social distancing in safety. So. We wouldn't ever ask people to go out and do something that would put themselves at risk, but we think that might be a kind of a fun way because all you need is a smartphone. Go out and take some interesting photos of the ward at this time. Maybe even beautiful photos might be really important right now. One of the things in my personal mental health journey, one of the, I think, most important things I learned along the way was acceptance. So that I was always going to have some level of anxiety. It's just part of who I am. That I will have days where I feel gloomier than other days, which actually might be pretty average. I hate the word normal because I've yet to meet anybody who's normal. But it might be pretty average to have days when you're feeling down. So I have those days and I accept that that's just going to be the way it is. So... There's this uh, notion or message that go has gone out, and I think it's so important for everybody to think about, and that's like not just let it skip off the surface of your mind, but to actually contemplate it's okay to not be okay during a pandemic. Why would you not feel some level of anxiety? Why would you not feel down some of the time? doesn't mean you have to wallow in it or doesn't mean you don't, can't find things to do that will engage your mind, <clears throat> engage your creativity, and, and you can find ways out of the depths of the gloom. Phone friends, video conference, you know, those things I think are so important. I spent one Saturday texting a ton of people and got a bunch of texts back, and it was kind of lovely just to reach out to people I hadn't engaged with in a long time. So acceptance that it's okay to not be okay because uh, what can happen is you can actually get anxious about being anxious. Oh my God, I'm anxious. And you could sort of um, exaggerate or add fuel 
to the anxiety be, by being anxious. Instead of just going, okay, yeah, I'm anxious, but who wouldn't be a bit anxious at this time? Or down, like I'm, I'm a little depressed about this. That's okay. Don't freak out about those feelings. I think if I've learned anything, it's accept them and try to breathe through them. Am I perfect at this? Gosh, no. I always have to, I always describe my mental health journey as one of practice. I forget things sometimes. Um, I get angry at people sometimes. And it's just this, I have to remember to accept that I'm not, I'm far from perfect. And others are too. And so that was really important for me to accept that. And then put things in practice. Put... Um, acceptance in practice, put um, the other, um, other strategies in place that help me stay relaxed and calm. Uh, I don't know what that would be for you. For me, it's recognizing that I have to be of service to people. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I offer service to other people, and again, that might be a text or a phone call to somebody you think might be lonely right now, that is a tremendous act of surface and a way to break this social isolation. You'll feel better after that phone call, I guarantee it. So that's those sort of um, mental health practices, self-care practices that I really encourage. So I gave a talk a couple months ago uh, at a breakfast and, and the theme of the talk I gave was flow. And there's a number of um, things that come to mind for me when we talk about this word flow. One was going with flow, which is a sort of a Taoist principle of life, the world, the universe, reality is ever changing. And we can um, fight that uh, or we can, like a, like a leaf in the stream, flow with it. And, um, and that's a really important thing for me to consider too, because I want the world sometimes to behave the way I want it to. And it never does, really. And so it's accepting, again, acceptance is the word acceptance, that people will behave as they behave. Uh, the world will unfold the way it unfolds. The Oilers uh, will not make the playoffs or will make the playoffs. Doesn't matter what I do. Uh, I will be elected or not elected. Uh, we, have, we have a sense of control of these things, and we work hard, but the world will unfold the way the world unfolds, and we will suffer setbacks and um, hurt feelings and all kinds of things. And if we just, the more we recognize that we have no control. I have no control over the pandemic. None. The only thing I can do is do the little things that keep me from uh, being um, adding to the list of people who are infected. But I can't. I have little other little control else. Uh, otherwise, we have our weekly meetings of city council, and and even there, you can feel kind of useless. <laughs> this is so big. And um, I have to learn to go with the flow with the pandemic. It'd be really hard. Uh, the other, the other um, meaning of flow came from an academic, a researcher called the most difficult pronounce and spell name in the world, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he wrote a book. I interviewed him when I was at the journal. He wrote a book called Flow. And it was all about these experiences we have in life where we're so engaged with a challenge, uh, so engaged with a passion we have, that we lose sense of self, lose a sense of time. And, um, and we're so involved in that, those are really enjoyable experiences. So there may be hobbies you have that you can engage yourself with right now that you can lose yourself in. Those are really important for our mental health. Um, I would even argue that being of service to other people and really engaging in volunteer work and other things 
allows you to lose your sense of self because your concern in those moments is helping someone else or helping the community instead of being self-obsessed and mental uh, mental health challenges are often tragic self-absorption or involve tragic self-absorption. Um, so focusing on the other even even briefly gives respite from uh, our, our never-ending cycle of worries and woes and regrets and fears. Uh, the Buddhists talk about, uh, call that the monkey mind, and, and it's a really good description of the way our minds work, chattering away, distracting us, uh, making us worry about things. So, um, I know there's been some questions coming in. I'll, I'll tell you, Rebecca Vischer, who I mentioned earlier, is in my office. We're social distancing appropriately, uh, but she's here to help me because I'm technologically uh, inept. And so she's the, she helped me get on here today and just uh, has delivered to me some questions. Uh, what is it, why is it important to take what we are doing now into the future after the pandemic? I've spent a lot of time thinking about how the pandemic will affect us. We know that there will be tremendous financial economic upset. We know there are a lot of people out there who've been laid off and are extremely worried about their future. My hope, maybe my optimistic take on this, is that there will be a greater sense of community come out of this. There's been a lot of focus on healthcare workers, appropriate focus on healthcare workers, because they're uh, risking their, their health to save lives and bring comfort to those that are miserably going through uh, more extreme cases of COVID. But there are bus drivers who are getting people to and from work. There are uh, grocery store workers who are stocking shelves. And there are uh, just, there are people, uh, truck drivers who are delivering products to those uh, grocery stores so we have food. There are a lot of people out on the front lines that if we consider for a moment, this is not my thought, somebody else put this, and it, it may be a Buddhist concept too, that we, we, are, we rely on uh, everyone to succeed in life. Uh, we all contribute to this community in one way or another. Um, people who volunteer at hospitals, uh, people, I often think of the people who work in social service agencies in the inner city as these unsung heroes doing work that is really hard to do, working with people that can be extremely challenging. Well, that's going on right now. And they're putting their health at risk as well, dealing with a very challenging population who uh, are really susceptible to COVID right now. So, so it is my hope that there's a broader recognition of how we all work together to make this a successful community. Um, that's my hope. Uh, the uh, second question is, can people share pictures of their home and yes, send them to Scott dot McKean, yes, um, yes they can. And I think like photos, um, photos can be uh, of anything. I could imagine that someone could take a picture of a shoe uh, done with the right light in the right context uh, at the right angle that would be an amazing shot and uh, could be of their um, pet, could be of their family, could be of some way that just a photo of how they're doing during this pandemic. I think we need to share more of that. There's some wonderful stuff I've seen on social media about people doing really well and some people having a laugh. One of the things that I was going to say, that's the other thing I've been doing is, is um, watching a lot of stand-up comedy on Netflix. Um, you know, uh, the oldest thing about laughter being the best medicine really works for me. Um, 
man, if you can have a good belly laugh right now, uh, it's not an insult to people who are struggling to look after your own self. Uh, if we're going to uh, successfully rebuild our communities after this and do it quickly, not only do we need each other, but we need to be healthy of physically and mentally. Or we've got to look after our spirits. So please share your, you can absolutely share your tension in a photo, but you can share the things that are giving you joy, or you can share your creativity with us in those, in those photos you send in. And we will, uh, on, in the comments below, put a, put a link to where people can send their photos in. We want to start that uh, and as we build it up, I'd really like to see us um, um, see more and more and more photos coming in. I'd love to do a photo walk with people, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the, that's the best idea right now. Uh, yeah, just uh, I see Rebecca brought me a note saying someone commented, commented that during this time, work at a senior's home is helping to keep her grounded. Well, and again, that ref to me, that speaks of service. That kind of work in a senior's home. My mom's in an extended care facility, which I can't go see her right now. But I have met a lot of the staff there, and they're remarkably kind, patient people. Their work are, involves daily acts of service. Uh, I actually... Uh, I'm jealous sometimes of people who are working the front lines to help people because I think some days they probably go home and cry because they see struggle, but other days they go home feeling a tremendous sense of contribution to community. Not false pride, not ego, but just a feeling that they've helped people. And I, I don't know if there's anything um, they're, they're, you, money can't buy that. You just cannot buy that. There's something about, the, I've said this to people, you know, in the Ward 6 office, occasionally we'll have some call in, we'll dispatch somebody from the city, the person will email back later in the day and said, thank you so much, that, that my problem was solved. And I'll say, you know what? that's a really, really good day in the Ward 6 office. It's not about um, the thing that hits the news. Often it's the little things we do to help people. It, it feels tremendous. Okay, and I got some other questions here. Um, yeah, so, uh, and thanks, Rebecca. Please call 211, 211, if you need or are looking for support. Keep 211 in mind. Uh, we will share information for our photos and mental health support uh, on my social media and on my blog, which I've written a little bit. I wrote a blog post about the privilege of being bored at a time when a lot of people are not bored. People are stressed out. Um, so, so, you know, when we're back to normal, um, I think, you know, this, how do you end social isolation? Again, I think look for opportunities. If you're feeling nervous, so I'm part introvert. It's not easy for me to walk into uh, a cocktail party or something. I don't feel comfortable. It takes me a while. I think a lot of people are like that. Some people would be like socially isolated. What are you talking about? They could walk into any situation and feel comfortable. Uh, uh, and that's not me. So you're gonna to have to push yourself a little bit and try various clubs. Um, there, are, there are a lot of ways uh, that you could join groups, you know, camera clubs, sports clubs, um, theater groups that you could, and there's volunteer opportunities like crazy. That, volunteering to me is the number one way to overcome social isolation. And um, the other major tip I'd have if you have the means, put some sort of, either set two lawn chairs out in the front lawn and sit there for part of the day um, or build a front veranda, which leads me to a, 
how we at the city have to do a lot more. We have to consider this a lot more about how we design communities, how we design our parks, how we design our public spaces to get people to naturally more comfortably bump into each other. Uh, I think one of the great things for an introvert like me is finding the right spot where I can sit with a coffee and people watch. Uh, I feel connected to a community then. Now I have to ask Rebecca a question because I'm technologically inept. Are we near the end? <clears throat> well, it's been half an hour. It's totally up to you. Oh, it's totally up to me. Uh, well, let me see if there's anything I wanted to touch on. Well, um, the changed world. I think that's, that's it's something that I, I hope all of us will think about. What kind of world do we want coming out of this? I want people who have been laid off to be looked after and not with crumbs. Uh, I want the unemployment rate um, to plummet, obviously. But if we cannot do that, then we have to find a way collectively as a country to, um, to look after those people, which probably will mean uh, some flattening of the, um, of, of the gap we have right now between rich and poor. Uh, I I'm, I'm tend to believe pretty strongly in, in entrepreneurship and at least small-scale uh, capitalism. I think corporations and the design, just the design of corporations, not, not the people who work there, uh, has created all sorts of issues for us. Um, but I think there's going to have to be a flattening of the curve of, of the way we distribute uh, income in our communities uh, in a way that still encourages entrepreneurship, hard work, all those things that I do really, I really do believe uh, lead to innovation and quality of life for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm no communist. Uh, and... Uh, but I think we're going to see change. I hope we see change. There's one, I read a piece that said we could go one of two ways. And that would be more authoritarian, more um, government surveillance. Um, that does not sound very good. Uh, for those of you, of you who have read 1984, there's a warning in that book that I think we should all take heed of. But the other way is that we just have a deeper sense of what I talked about earlier about our interconnectedness as a community, how the grocery store clerk is integral to our lives or the person working in uh, at social agencies in the inner city is integral to our lives, our quality of life, the vibrancy of our community. My highest goal in this term has been to try to get supportive housing built for those that are homeless and the most wounded. We're going to continue that work because those people deserve a place to live in safety and, and, and more comfort. If you went back 40 years, they would have been in probably housed in psychiatric hospitals, um, which, which weren't great but we, we abandoned them. And by doing that, we have set up a system where the police and the courts and emergency rooms have been overloaded by these really vulnerable, uh, really wounded people. So we got to change that. And I, that'll be something that I will continue to work on and continue to push for. Um, because we will save tens of millions of dollars in Edmonton on this very community. A lot of that savings will be uh, accrued by the provincial government. So we have got to get Mr. Kenny and his cabinet on board with that. So far, uh, lukewarm response from them. I get it. It's, uh, it doesn't seem like a natural constituency to be worried about. But enlightened self-interest says our communities will be safer, crime will be down, and our police, paramedics, emergency room doctors, hospitals, uh, bylaw officers, park rangers, these people will have far, far, far less work to do and will save uh, 
oodles of money. So I wanted to mention that. And I, I guess, I guess ultimately, I hope we come out of this with just a greater sense, sort of of all the things I've talked about. It's what do we mean by community? We all have to define that for ourselves. I'm not telling anybody. Anything I've said today are my beliefs. They're not right or wrong. And I think, I think it's interesting watching the science and the scientific debate around COVID and some um, drugs that may or may not work. Science debates things for a long time. Uh, and I, I, I've come, I've been, um, on my own terms, I've come to realize that um, we struggle to find ultimate answers, but I really try to keep an open mind and wait till things are really settled before I uh, reach any kind of conclusive opinion. Maybe that's the journalist in me, but um, I return to this sense of community and I will always return to that because we know that people living in connected, have a, who have a sense of connection are happier and they're healthier. Uh, uh, I want, we are, we are integral to that community and what we put out, uh, will be integral to the community. So there, it was a <clears throat> psychologist who said that to me years ago, uh, lifestyle with Mary Scott, and I had to ponder that for a while, but it's absolutely true. What we put out in life is what we get back. Now, some, of, I think, have mistaken that to mean if I work really hard, I'll make a lot of money. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is if I'm kind to other people and serve other people, I will then become part of a supportive community that will look after me in times of need as well. So community leagues are the other um, really important part of this story and when we're talking about community. And I think Edmonton's... Edmonton gets described all the time to me by people who visit here or people who've moved here as a remarkable community. And I'm sort of like, really? Uh, because I've lived here since I was six years old. Um, but they say it over and over and over again that people are really friendly here. People are really welcoming here. People are really kind here. And the sort of uh, values that I talked about of being of service are embedded in our community. Why would that be? I think it's community leagues. And our community league system, which has been around for 100 years, not all, other cities don't have this. Other cities didn't foster that um, volunteer spirit that community leagues do. If we're gonna have our kids um, playing soccer and hockey and other things, well, a lot of people have to be coaches and coordinators and assistant coaches and referees and and they have to help, and they have the fundraising, all that stuff comes, you just, it's just a part of, part of the status quo in Edmonton. So I wanted to, and as I often have done, give a shout out to community leagues for their contribution. Um, so I think I'm going to end it there. There's a saying <clears throat> in an organization I've been involved with over the years, uh, I've heard it said many times in that saying is, well, take what you need and leave the rest. So if anything I have said is helpful, uh, that, that will, well, that's a good thing. If you disagree with things I said, that's totally fair. Uh, I am certainly not uh, an expert on everything. This is just my take on community and isolation, mental health. And I wish only for you that during these times of real crisis that you find ways to connect, you find ways to bring some joy to your life, you find some ways to laugh. And please understand that we will not only get through this, but we will rebuild lives and rebuild our community in ways that I think will be more just and fair vibrant and lovely and full of art, full of music and full of laughter.